Hi, I'm Jeff Groh, and this is Differential Equations, Lecture 18. I'd like to talk about the undamped pendulum. If a pendulum starts straight down and then slides out in this direction, making an angle theta here, then let's suppose that the position vector of the pendulum is given by, well, let's suppose r is the length of the pendulum, and x, x values of our coordinate system will increase as we go this way. Let's suppose that we have then sine theta, since when theta is 0, the x value will be 0. y values will begin negative, so we'll have negative r cosine theta describing positions of points in the xy plane putting our coordinate system here. The velocity vector is just the derivative of this with respect to time. Theta is a function of when calculating the derivative of sine we must use the chain rule because we have an inside function and an outside function. This will give us theta dot r cosine theta. The theta dot comes from the chain rule, taking the derivative of the inside function and multiplying that on. Over here, we'll end up with theta dot r sine theta. And we'll factor the theta dot and the r out, leaving just this unit vector cosine theta sine theta. Now, the acceleration vector requires the use of the product rule. So we'll have theta dot dot r times the vector cosine theta sine theta. But we'll add to that the derivative over here. The derivative here will have an additional factor of theta dot. So we'll get theta dot squared r minus sine theta cosine theta. Now, some of this acceleration is being counteracted by the pendulum. The only portion of the acceleration which can contribute to changes in motion is that that is in the direction of the velocity vector. In other words, the portion that is not in the direction of the velocity vector is counteracted by the pendulum arm itself. The part of the acceleration that can do anything to change the motion is the part of the acceleration that is projected onto the velocity vector. This calculation requires that we calculate the dot product of the acceleration and the velocity divided by the norm of the velocity squared times the velocity vector itself. The dot product of two vectors is calculated by multiplying corresponding coordinates and adding them up. Notice that if I take the dot product of this vector with this one down here, I get zero because I'll have negative sine cosine plus positive sine cosine. But the dot product of this part gives me one times these coefficients. So when I take the dot product of A and V, I'll get theta dot, theta dot dot, r squared. Theta dot, theta dot dot, r squared, times 1. The norm squared of the velocity vector is going to be theta dot squared, r squared, and then this has a norm of 1. What's left is to multiply by the vector v. So we multiply by another theta dot r, cosine theta, sine theta. You can see that the theta dot squareds cancel and these r squareds cancel, leaving us with theta dot dot r times cosine theta, sine theta. The acceleration due to gravity is straight down, but again, a portion of this is being counteracted by the pendulum. 
only the projection of the acceleration due to gravity onto the velocity vector can do anything. So we need to calculate the dot product of g and v over the norm of v squared times v. Calculating the dot product of g and v gives us negative g theta dot r sine theta. Dividing by the norm of v squared gives us theta dot squared r squared, and then we multiply by the vector v, which is theta dot r cosine theta sine theta. Simplifying, all of the r's go, all of the theta dots go. We're left with negative g sine theta cosine theta sine theta. The two methods of calculating the acceleration have to be equal. And so we deduce that this quantity up here must in fact equal this one here. They must be the same. Since the vector part cosine theta sine theta is equal, we deduce that theta dot dot r must equal negative g sine theta. After all this work, we get the second order nonlinear equation theta dot dot equals minus g sine theta divided by r, where g and r are constants. g is the constant acceleration due to gravity, and r is the constant length of the pendulum r. We can convert this second order nonlinear equation into a first order nonlinear system. What we'll do is we'll set omega equal to theta dot. In that case, we'll have the following system. Theta dot equals omega, and omega dot, notice that omega dot is theta dot dot. That will be minus g sine theta divided by r. There's your first order system. We need to find the equilibria. And to do that, we set the right-hand side equal to zero. One of those is omega equals zero, which makes sense since omega is the angular velocity. If you have angular velocity on a pendulum, then you don't have an equilibrium point. It has to be someplace where the pendulum has stopped and hence omega has to be zero. Also, we must also have minus g over r sine theta equals zero. But we can divide these constants off. We're only looking for places where sine theta equals zero. That means theta has to be an integer multiple of pi. In other words, theta has to be in the set, say negative 2 pi, negative pi, 0, pi, 2 pi, and so on. To plot the equilibria, we put them on a theta omega coordinate system. All of these equilibrium points have an omega coordinate equal to 0. However, theta then will be 0, pi, 2 pi, negative pi, negative 2 pi, and so on in both directions. Next, we need to classify the equilibrium points at all of these locations, the equilibria being at points n pi, 0. To do that, we calculate the derivative matrix for the right-hand sides of our system. First, 
with respect to theta in the first uh, in the first equation we get zero. The derivative with respect to omega will be one. The derivative here with respect to theta is negative g over r cosine theta, and then the derivative here with respect to omega is zero. Now, we need to evaluate the matrix of partial derivatives at each of these equilibrium points. So, to that end, df at n pi zero will be zero, one. If I'm plugging in an integer multiple of pi into cosine, note that the cosine of n pi is negative 1 to the n. If n is 0, I'm looking at the cosine of 0, in which case I get positive 1. Negative 1 to the 0 is positive 1. If n is equal to 1, I get cosine of pi, which is negative 1. Negative 1 to the negative 1 is negative 1, and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to have here is negative 1 to the n times this negative. I'll get negative 1 to the n plus 1, g over r, and then 0. To classify each of these equilibrium points, we need to find the eigenvalues of this matrix. To calculate those eigenvalues, we'll set 0 equal to the determinant of the matrix that we get by subtracting lambda from the diagonal elements. This gives a positive lambda squared, and then we subtract negative 1 to the n plus 1, g over r. The outcome depends upon the value of n. Notice that if n is, say, odd, if we add an odd number to 1, we'll have an even number. And so we end up with lambda squared minus g over r. But that's going to give us lambda equals plus or minus the square root of g over r, and that's when n is odd. Odd values of n give you real eigenvalues with opposite signs, plus or minus. If n is even, even plus 1 gives you odd. An odd power of negative 1 gives you a negative 1. Negative, negative gives you positive. Lambda squared plus g over r equals 0 will be the characteristic equation. That will give us lambda equals plus or minus i times the square root of g over r whenever n is even. So we deduce that we get different results. In the case that n is even, we get centers. And in the case when n is odd, we get saddles. Let's see if this makes sense. Around theta equals 0, with small angular momenta, what should happen? Well, we should get a center, because 0 is even. When we perturb the angular velocity just a little bit positive, what does that do to the angle? It makes the angle get bigger. And so it looks like once you reach a maximum, the angular velocity will go to 0. Angular velocity will make it swing back. That makes the angles get smaller. And so we'll orbit around this equilibrium point at the origin in a clockwise fashion like this. Theta equals pi means the pendulum is straight up. If the pendulum is straight up, that is not stable. It's very hard to balance something that's going straight up like this. And so you'll have a, an unstable saddle whenever n is odd. You'll have the solutions coming in in some directions and going out in other directions. 
So over here, we'll have another one of those centers, but here it's a, it's a saddle point. As you trend this way, it uh, goes back out over that way. So these are all going to be centers, and these are all going to be saddles like this. Notice, however, what's going to happen. These are going to connect over And if the angular velocity is outside of this range up here, what's going to happen is that the pendulum will have the angle which increases always if the angular moment, momentum, angular velocity is really high. As you get up towards straight up, pi or negative pi, that's where you're at your slowest, the smallest angular velocity. When you're at theta equals zero or two pi straight down, that's when you have the highest angular velocity. So if, it's, if the angular velocity starts high enough, it's just going to go around and around and around fastest on the downward part of the swing and slowest on the upward part of the swing. Same thing if the angular velocity is going the other way. except it goes in this direction this time. Or this is what is called a phase portrait for this system. You can tell exactly what's going to happen with the solution curves, depending upon where the initial data starts the curve off.